back there with the new cost vote and speaking support both of that and of the new cost 15. Uh, and in doing so, I want to start by thanking Shikosians who spoke to the Shadow Minister and me and to Fagan Solicitors for facilitating that discussion and drafting these amendments. And as honourable members will note, the honourable members opposite. The honourable member for Crawley, where we find the UK's largest Chicossian diaspora, Henry Smith, has championed Chicossians for many years. At second reading, I asked the government to consider introducing a clause that would rectify some of the injustices that Chicossians have faced for more than half a century. And I understand he will bring an amendment to do that at report stage, but today we seek to probe the government's initial thinking on this. I think we could speak all day about how outrageously the Chagossians were treated by the UK and the US in uh, being removed from their island simply to make way for an airbase and dumped in Mauritius and elsewhere and basically forgotten about. There are a myriad of injustices that are still to be put right. These amendments don't fix everything, but they would fix significant injustices in relation to nationality, exactly what part one of this bill was supposed to do, and in relation to the family. Some Chagossians will benefit from provisions in part one of this bill, which is welcome, but it needs to go much further if they are to have access to the citizenship that is rightly theirs and has only been denied them by the outrageous events of the late 1960s and the early 1970s. As we touched on Sir Roger during debates in part one, citizenship by descent in British nationality law and British overseas territories nationality law usually only stretches to one generation. So if we move abroad, the children we will have there will be British by descent, but if they then remain abroad and have kids, they won't be able to pass on that British citizenship. And that reflects the idea that the family have made a voluntary decision to loosen their links to the UK and to build a new life elsewhere. So citizenship of that country, uh, where they now live, is probably more appropriate. Exceptions are made, for example, if the only reason um, was that the person was abroad it was Crown Service, for example, or if the parent who generally couldn't pass on citizenship actually has lived in the UK for three years previously or goes on to do so. And all of that, again, just illustrates the point that it's trying to reflect the idea of a voluntary link to the UK that justifies continued transmission of UK citizenship. But none of that can clearly apply to the Chagossians. The situation there is obviously manifestly different. The only reason why Chagossians cannot pass on their uh, British overseas territory citizenship is because, of course, they were forcibly removed from the islands. Nobody chose to make a new life in Mauritius or anywhere else. Far from it. Nobody can say they have voluntarily chosen to take on a new identity elsewhere. Any undermining or breaking of the link was completely forced upon them in quite the most outrageous circumstances. And that in itself should be enough to justify new Clause 15. <coughs> and the knock-on effect, of course, is that when the law was changed in 2002, while some Chagossians became British citizens as well as British overseas territory citizens, others missed out. So we're now in a horrible situation where some have the right to rekindle their British identity and return here, but others do not. If I'm a Chagossian whose parent was born just before being forcibly removed from the islands and was therefore uh, BOTC by birth, I'm likely to be in a far better position than my cousin, for example, whose parents were born just days after being forced from the islands and therefore cannot transmit their BOT, uh, BOT citizenship or indeed British citizenship. In introducing the bill, the Home Secretary said, it will mean children unfairly denied British overseas territory citizenship will finally be able to acquire citizenship as well as British citizenship. What happened to the Chagossians and what they still face today is an absolute scandal and the least we can do is to ensure that all of them can access the nationality that the UK and the US action deprived them of. New Clause 4 would fix another unfairness. Now I absolutely detest the restrictive rules that the Home Office have put in place on family visas that say you must be earning uh, certain sums of money before you can bring your non-national spouse or children here. But putting that to one side for the moment, even accepting the government's own logic, these provisions shouldn't apply to the spouses and family members of Chagossians. Essentially, the government logic is that if people choose to build family life elsewhere and then to come back to the UK, they should have certain financial means to support themselves and the knowledge of the UK. But of course, Chagossians again did not choose to make their family life outside British overseas territories. That was forced upon them. It would now be totally unfair to restrict the right to come to the UK by imposing those rules on their families as if this was their choice. It was a step in the right direction to provide British citizenship to some in 2002, but it's cruel to deny effective access to those rights by denying the family members the right to come here. And that's particularly so given that the reason why many will not be able to meet the financial thresholds is because of the horrendous way that they've been treated for decades and, and extraordinary deprivation that they've had to endure. So again, the Home Office will look to help fix this uh, one of, or some of two uh, of the many injustices that have been visited on the Chagossians. Minimum income requirement of family members of British citizens with a connection to the British Indian Ocean.
territory. The question is that new clause four be read a second time. Uh, thanks, Sir Roger. Sir Roger, I was speaking to uh, New Clause 15, which is grouped with New Clause 4, uh, and I fully endorse what the Honourable uh, Member Spokesperson for the SNP has said in his remarks. New Clause 15 seeks to rectify a long standing issue in British nationality law that affects a relatively small number of people, the Shagosian people, descendants of the Chagos Islanders, who were forcibly removed from the British Indian Ocean Territory in the 1960s. Between 1968 and 1974, the UK forcibly removed thousands of Chagosians from their homelands on the Chagos Islands. This removal was done to make way for the US military base on Diego Garcia. The Chagosians were a settled population on the islands. Their origins trace back to 1793. They were removed and deported to either to other territories, namely Mauritius and the Seychelles, and more than, which were more than 1,600 kilometers away from the Chagos Islands and have faced extreme poverty and discrimination in these places. Because of the removal, many descendants of the Chagos Islanders, despite being the grandchildren of people who were British subjects in the British Indian o Ocean Territory, have been denied rights to British citizenship. In 2002, the British Overseas Territories Act granted British citizenship to resettled Chagosians born between 1969 and 1982. The children of those born to, uh, on the British Indian Ocean Territory However, many Chagosians have still been denied citizenship, including second-generation Chagosians born outside of these dates. And the grandchildren of those born on the British Indian Ocean Territory, third-generation Chagosians, who do not have rights to British citizenship, uh, do not have rights to British citizenship, as citizenship has not automatically been passed to them, even if, in some cases, they migrated to the UK with their British parents at a very young age. This group, therefore, often become an undocumented presence in the UK once they reach the age of 18 and are denied access to jobs, housing and healthcare, despite having lived in the UK since a very young age. The Chagosian community is divided between Mauritius, the Seychelles and the UK. Broken and divided families are therefore a direct consequence of this injustice in British nationality law. For 60 years the Chagosian people have faced dispersal, poverty and separation and it has severely limited their life chances and damaged the health and well-being of generations of people. The bill in its current state does not cover the British citizenship and immigration issues that the Chagosian community faces, and that is why the opposition is introducing this new clause and wishes to raise the issue today. It's worth exploring this unfairness in more detail and the reasons why legislation has failed to rectify it to date. Under British nationality law, citizenship is normally only passed to one generation born abroad. However, the situation of the Chagosians uh, is fundamentally different from that of other inhabited British overseas territories, and applying this restriction to the Chagosians is unacceptable. As we know, their parents and grandparents were forcibly removed from their homeland and deported to Mauritius and the Seychelles. Since then, the Chagosian people have been born outside the Chagos uh, archipelago and received citizenship from Mauritius or the Seychelles, with no recognition of their, of their long-standing ties to British nationality. It is not possible for the descendants of the Chagos Islanders to be born on the islands of the British Indian Ocean Territory due to the order, of, uh, order in Council since 2004, which bans any Chagosians from living on, the, on their native land. This is deeply unfair. They have not severed links with their British citizenship voluntarily. They have been excluded by the UK government. At this point, I would like to share the personal experience of those affected by this injustice. Like many of the committee, I've been contacted by members of this community who would like to pay tribute to their campaigning efforts uh, in incredibly distressing and difficult circumstances, including groups such as the Chagosian Voices. Pascal Francois is one of those affected. Pascal resides in Mauritius and is Chagosian. Pascal says, For years we have suffered from the separation of our families through no fault of our own. We are as British as you and the next person. We wish to be known as British and we belong to the UK and her territories. The Chagosian people in exile no longer want to live in the shadows of others. We want to belong and be British by descent. The battle for Chagosian rights um, has been raging for decades and this group of people have been badly let down by the UK. Most Chagosian families already financially in fact impacted by their enforced exile are paying and have for many years paid huge and increasing visa immigration citizenship fees health surcharges and legal expenses for spouses and children with pending or rejected applications. 
This process has significantly damaged their health, well-being and livelihoods, and it's caused immense stress and there is understandable frustration at the lack of support from the Home Office. Many face the threat of deportation, including young people who have lived in the UK for most of their lives and whose parents are British. Ordinarily, they would have British citizens, uh, British citizen rights, but because of their exile, they've been denied their rights. This injustice in British nationality law has lasted for more than half a century. We believe it requires special attention and cross-party support. Uh, the opposition's new clause uh, aims to highlight this injustice. It would allow anyone who is descended from a person born before 1983 on the British Indian Ocean Territory to register as a British Overseas Territory citizen. In turn, they may also register as a British citizen. Both of these applications would be free of charge. And despite our deep concern about other measures in this uh, piece of legislation, the book provides an opportunity for the UK to end this injustice for the descendants of the, of the Chagos Islanders and rectify a long-standing anomaly in British nationality law. And I hope this opportunity is uh, taken. So much I'd like to move. Minister. Thank you, um, Mr Chairman, and I appreciate the Honourable Member's positive intent behind New Clause 4, which seeks to create a means whereby, in the future, British citizens who were born on or descended from a person born on the British Indian Ocean Territory will be able to bring their foreign national spouse or partner to the UK without them being subject to the current financial and English language requirements for family migration. I would like to remind honourable members that the minimum income requirement has been based on in-depth analysis and advice from the Independent Migration Advisory Committee. The purpose of the minimum income requirement, implemented in July 2020, along with other reforms of the family immigration rules, is to ensure family migrants are supported at a reasonable level so they do not become a burden on the taxpayer and they can participate sufficiently in everyday life to facilitate their integration into British society. Family life must not be established here at the taxpayer's expense and family migrants must be able to integrate if they are to play a full part in British life. The minimum income requirement was set following advice from the Independent Migration Advisory Committee at 18,600 for sponsoring a partner rising to 22,400 for also sponsoring a non-qualifying child and, a, and an additional 2,400 for each further such child. There is no flexibility with regard to the level of the minimum income requirement which must be met in all cases subject to the requirement. It is right and fair it should be consistently applied in all cases. Expecting family migrants and their sponsors to be financially independent is reasonable both to them and the taxpayer. In February 2017, the Supreme Court upheld the lawfulness of the minimum income requirement under the Family Immigration Rules. The Court found the minimum income requirement is not a breach of the right to respect for private and family life under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights and is not discriminatory. The Supreme Court endorsed our approach in setting an income requirement for family migration, which prevents burdens on the taxpayer and ensures migrant families can integrate into our communities. The Supreme Court agreed this strikes a fair balance between the interests of those wishing to sponsor a partner to settle in the UK and of the community in general. Being able to speak English is also fundamental to successful integration into British society. I will Mr McDonald, can I just gently say that I think the tenor of this response is slightly tone deaf. First of all, the Migration Advisory Committee have asked the government to, to revisit the financial thresholds that it's talking about. But secondly, we're talking about Chagossians forcibly removed from the islands. Fine, consistency, but these are truly exceptional circumstances. Surely most taxpayers would be perfectly understanding that different rules have to apply in these outrageous circumstances. Well, I think what I'd say, in fairness to the um, Honourable Gentleman, is that he's intervened on me relatively early in my remarks in relation um, to these amendments. So let me conclude um, in what I'm saying. Let me continue. Um, but, I, but I hear the point that he raises and, um, and I, of course, take it on board in the way that I take all comments from honourable members on this committee um, on board in my thinking. Um, we expect those coming to the UK on a family visa with only basic English to become more fluent over time as a means of encouraging better integration into our society, to make it easier for families to access vital public services and enable parents to support their children's education. I want to emphasise that new clause 4 undermines the sound basis on which family migration to this country has been placed in recent years. It would circumvent the need for family migration to be on a basis whereby families are financially independent and able to contribute to the UK. It would also remove the English language requirement which is fundamental to a migrant's successful integration into British society. 
There is no justifiable reason to give preferential treatment to family members based solely on their sponsor's nationality. Without a clear justification for doing so, it is also likely this would constitute unlawful discrimination. <coughs> the immigration rules on family migration, which New Clause 4 would effectively undermine, are designed to prevent burdens on the taxpayer, promote integration and tackle abuse, and thereby ensure that family migration to the UK is on a properly sustainable basis, which is fair to migrants and the wider community. The rules are helping to ensure public confidence in the immigration system. The new clause proposed by the Honourable Member, well intended as it may be, has the potential to reverse this. In the same way, the introduction of a dual family migration system as required by new clause 4 would not be seen in a uniformly positive way by British citizens and persons settled here. It would lead to an undesirable two-tier system of family migration in which a group of family members whose sponsor is a British citizen with a connection to the British Indian Ocean Territory are given preferential treatment over other sponsors. Furthermore, the Government has the power under the Immigration Act 1971 to set out the requirements for entry into and stay in the UK in immigration rules, which are then laid before Parliament. The rules allow flexibility to amend policy as appropriate. The Government continues to regularly review the immigration rules to ensure that they are fair and effective. Work is ongoing on simplification of the rules following the recommendations of the Law Commission. This new clause would have the effect of undermining that process and prescribing the rules in primary legislation for one particular cohort. Turning to new clause 15, through this bill, we are already making changes to address historic unfairness so that all those born on the British Indian Ocean Territory and their children are either automatically British citizens or have the right to acquire British nationality. The amendment tabled in the name of the Honourable Member for Enfield Southgate and the Honourable Member for Halifax seeks to go much further and addresses what is seen as the consequences of historic unfairness. While I'm sympathetic with that, I am concerned that this is not the correct approach. The amendment will offer British citizenship in perpetuity to those born outside the UK and overseas territories, regardless of their connection to the UK, as long as they are descendants of someone born on the islands making up the British Indian Ocean Territory. I will give that. Mr MacDonald. not entirely surprised that the, the, the first point the Minister raises is about the, the lack of any sort of limit on this. If there was some sort of limit uh, on uh, the, the degree of relationship that had to be with the Chagossian, would that be more amenable to, uh, to him and to the Home Office? Again, I, 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 if he lets me conclude my remarks, I hope that it will give him a little bit of comfort um, around this point. Um, this approach cannot be right and undermines the long-standing principle of British nationality law that nationality or entitlements to nationality are not passed on to the second and subsequent generations born and settled outside the UK and territories. I recognise, however, that the Chagossians present a unique case. My honourable friend, the member for Crawley, has long campaigned on behalf of the Chagossian communities, both in his constituency and throughout the UK as vice-chairman of the all-party parliamentary group on the Chagos Islands and he has indicated he intends to table an amendment at report stage on this issue. I would like to reflect further on the complex issues that the Chagossian communities in the UK and those in Mauritius <coughs> in the state of Shelves face and have been raised during the course of this debate by members um, on both sides um, and that I am mindful um, there is a cross-party view um, on this that has been expressed um, before making any significant changes to nationality law. Um, as I say, it seems to me that members um, from different parties in this House have expressed views on this. Um, I've taken on board the points that have been raised. Um, and what I would say to um, the Honourable Gentleman is that in relation to this Chagossian issue, um, there is a willingness to go away and look closely at this. And with that, I would hope that the Honourable Members will be willing to withdraw their amendments. Mr MacDonald. Thank you. We will revisit this at report stage, as the Minister says. We'll go away and consider uh, what has been said, but in the meantime, I beg leave to withdraw. Uh,